invite James Perry up here. Many of you heard James Perry a year ago when I invited him to speak at last year's conference. And speak he did with such a powerful voice that people could not stop talking about the effect that he had on them. So I had to invite you back. I've had the pleasure of serving with James on the board of the National Fair Housing Alliance for a number of years. Uh, <clears throat> James Perry is a man that I admire greatly for his leadership, his wisdom, and his vision. Also for his choice of partner, I can't help but mention her again, Melissa Harris Perry, who's a writer, professor, TV host, and political commentator, also with a powerful voice. I've known James Perry for, well, since he was the executive director of the Greater New Orleans Fair Housing Action Center, both before and after Katrina. I'm really thrilled to have him here today. So without further ado, please welcome him. Good morning, how's everyone doing? Good. So I, I, I told Caroline I'm happy to come back, um, but that I only have one speech and I gave it last year. <laughs> so folks are gonna be kind of bored. Um, uh, but, but I am happy to be here uh, in um, uh, uh, Northern California. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that I realized as I started thinking about uh, what was going on here is that this is a really exciting place to be, and it's a particularly exciting time. It's a difficult time, but an exciting time. Um, and I, I'm not sure if you all are convinced. Um, of what I believe about this particular community and California in general, but I, I really do think that California is the front line in the war to integrate American cities. Now, you all don't look like you're at war, right? Um, and, um, you know, usually when folks are at war, you see all kind of weaponry and all kind of stuff, and you guys look pretty relaxed. Um, and so part of my job this morning is to get you to believe that you're at war, right? <laughs> so I say, yeah, right, whatever, this guy's goddamn lunatic. Um, <laughs> so, um, but no, seriously, we are absolutely at war, and the battlefield is, uh, is a serious place. Uh, it is absolutely dangerous, and um, so I'm going to show all of you pictures of of our battlefield, um, and these are sobering. I don't think you guys are responding the way I intended. <laughs> these are absolutely sobering pictures of the war battlefield. Um, and I, I think this is exactly what happens. Some of us see the battlefield and we say, well, it, you know, I understand that this is war and it's a battlefield, but, you know, I have for a long time have needed a place with off-street parking, you know? And, you know, this place has curb appeal. It really works. I have always wanted a place with a fireplace, right? And God forbid these folks allow dogs. They allow pets, right? All right, so maybe the places with pets are, are not, uh, don't have to be the battlefield, but here's the point. Um, the point is that there really are very few places uh, where we have an amazing opportunity to truly integrate American cities. And I, of course, housing is the subject matter, but California is actually one of the few uh, jurisdictions where we have an opportunity to do that. And, and it's not going to be easy. Um, so you, as we think about these challenges, um, obviously it's pretty clear to all of us that we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Federal Fair Housing Act. We are uh, lamenting the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. Last year, I, one of the themes that I focused on was discomfort. And I focused on the way that, that Dr. King was uncomfortable. One of the things that a lot of folks don't realize is that in the summer before his assassination, in 1967, King spent that, uh, a good bit of that summer in Chicago, 
marching for housing opportunity, pushing to make sure that there was fair housing opportunity. And what he said was that that was one of the most difficult experiences that he ever had because when he pushed for people to integrate uh, in housing in Chicago, he faced some of the most virulent racists that he had ever met in his entire time working. So what, what became really, really clear when you looked at King's work was that there was a driving theme in the way that he got things done. And, and that theme was crisis. Right? One of the things that, that he talked about was using direct action to create a pressure-filled crisis climate to drive people to the negotiation table. He believed that crisis can drive change. Now, what's interesting about California is that you guys have been in housing crisis for a very, very long time. There are very few communities that have dealt with the kind of crisis that you guys have dealt with. So housing prices in California are more than double the average housing prices in, um, uh, that are the US average. That's a significant challenge. See my slides here. The average rent in California is about 450 bucks higher than the average rent in the rest of the nation. And in San Francisco, it is uh, up more than twice the average rent in the rest of the nation. In order to catch up with the housing need, most years the uh, state of California would have to build double the number of houses, housing units that it currently builds. Right. The other interesting thing is that home prices here have grown dramatically faster than home prices in the rest of the nation, not just recently, but since the 1940s. Right. Since the 1940s, we've seen this dramatic increase in the cost of housing as compared to the rest of the nation in California. And in the 1980s, we got to this point where the cost of housing in California just consistently was double what it cost in the rest of the nation. So basically, since the 1940s, California has been uh, approaching housing crisis. And in the, in the 70s or 80s, California hit housing crisis. But everybody's really calm, patient, right? Uh, on, on, in the news this morning, in the, the Marin County news, uh, one of the stories is that there's a 23% increase uh, in the cost of housing in Marin County. Over last year, 23%. Wow, it's amazing. I mean, that has to be a crisis, right? So one of the problems is that, you know, if you're out there hunting for a crisis, this is not the perfect crisis, right? It's kind of a flawed crisis, right, for all of us crisis hunters. But the first problem with this crisis is that it doesn't affect everybody. If you want a perfect crisis, you really need a crisis that hurts everybody. The truth is that this crisis mostly afflicts poor people, and you know, lower middle income people. But if, uh, but, you know, if you have a decent job, you can make it, right? You can survive. The other problem is that it's a really slow crisis, right? I mean, this shows that it's been happening since 1940. It's not something that just goes boom immediately, right? You need an immediate crisis to really get people to act, to really get people to move. Um, so I was talking to, to your, uh, your later speaker, George, earlier, and, and George, what did you call it? Apocalypse. An apocalypse on an installment plan. Right? <laughs> right. 
So, you know, if you think about this idea that Dr. King was able to, to use nonviolent action to create crisis and then to create change, and not just change, but change that dramatically transformed a nation, then, you know, how can we capitalize, frankly, on the crisis that is afflicting California to change a nation? Um, and I think this is a, a really reasonable question to ask, right? And I think sometimes this is the kind of question that makes people uncomfortable, right? This idea of capitalizing on, on, the, the, um, on the ways that people are harmed or hurt. Um, but it's been happening for a very long time, this idea of capitalizing on crisis. Well, unfortunately, there is a perfect, perfectly devastating crisis happening here. The recent fires in uh, Northern California killed 44 people, destroyed 8,400 structures, damaged more than 21,000 homes and 2,800 businesses. It cost more than $9.4 billion in insurance claims. About 100,000 residents were forced to flee their homes. And that's just here in Northern California. So, you know, the, the reason that I feel comfortable talking about crisis and about this idea of capitalizing on crisis is, uh, is that I've been through some crisis, right? So this is the city of New Orleans. In August of 2005, shortly after Hurricane Katrina hit. Uh, one of the really interesting things for me, looking at pictures of fire devastated neighborhoods in Northern California is that some of them look just like um, the Lower Ninth Ward, frankly, still looks today. Because of Hurricane Katrina, there was a 20-foot storm surge. 1,836 uh, people died. There are 705 people that were never accounted for. Eighty percent of the city was covered with water. The average depth of that water was 12 feet. And there was $81 billion in property damage. Now, my house is just up over here in the uh, upper left corner. I don't live there anymore. Uh, but that, that's where I lived. So, obviously it was a very sobering time and really difficult. But one of the major challenges was that all of us as advocates were so focused on responding to the moment that we didn't realize that policymakers certainly were focused on the moment, but they also were making policy that was going to dramatically affect our lives forever. Forever. And so the question for us became, how can we do both, right? How can we focus on the moment but also make sure that we are impactful in the policies so that we can make sure that those policies ensure that New Orleans and Louisiana is a better place in 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Frankly, we lost some of those fights and we won some of those fights. And so what I wonder is whether or not this community has an opportunity to 
do things a little bit better than we did in Louisiana, hopefully a lot better. So I want to tell you about a few of the cases that we worked on and some of the lessons that we learned that I hope that I can pass on. Right. So, you know, one of the interesting narratives that comes up after a disaster uh, is that everyone has been affected, right? That a storm like Katrina, uh, a, a huge fire uh, is blind. Uh, it doesn't know race, it doesn't know ethnicity, it doesn't know sex, disability, or any of those issues. And so any and everyone can be affected. All right? uh, and so what can happen is that people can lose sight of the idea that people who are poor, people who are historically disenfranchised, who've always had it hard, will have it even harder if there's been a huge disaster. When I was watching some of the news coverage, uh, you know, there was a guy who was standing in front of his burned down mansion uh, and uh, he was almost in tears because he had lost everything. And it was extremely sad and it was really easy to see how he becomes one of the faces of, of these fires. But you also have to wonder about all the people who he employed, who many of whom had to commute in because they couldn't afford to live in the community, and about what happened to their homes, what happened to their belongings, and about their story that hadn't been told. So one of the ways that we were able to make sure that all the stories were told was to tell the housing story. Right. So we did um, a few different studies of housing discrimination. We did an audit where we would send, do traditional fair housing testing, right? mystery shopping. We'd send um, a black person and a white person to the same apartment complex, and in theory, they should get the same treatment. And what we found, of course, was that in six out of 10 uh, tests, our African-American tester was treated less favorably than our white tester. Um, and this was at a time when our community was supposed to be banding together. That had been the story, was that everyone was working together. Right? And so what became clear, of course, was that the historic discrimination that had plagued our community was still strong. So the first lesson here in Crisis 101 is that you do have to make sure that you are playing some significant role in what the media is communicating to the general public, right? Because everybody is watching and listening. So the, the second thing is about policy, is about how you get policymakers to hear you and to listen. Um, so one of the most frustrating uh, things that, that we experienced was having meeting after meeting after meeting with policymakers. And so all due respect to the policymakers who were in the room from, um, from county government, city government, state government, and from HUD. Woo! <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and I don't have any um, you know, ill will towards folks who do a lot of meetings with um, government folks, but we took a different approach. Uh, we sued them. All right. And we sued every single one of them that did anything wrong. Now, folks who didn't do anything wrong, we did not sue them. They didn't need to be sued. They were great, and we love them, right? But, but the ones who would just try to run the clock by talking to us but not take any action, we didn't waste time. We sued them, right? And, um, and so we, we had to fundamentally shift our focus and stop um, uh, and stop putting so much time into mom and pop landlords and think about what would have the most effect. And so we shifted our focus to um, entities that controlled policy. So all of these cases, and there are more, have really incredible and interesting stories. I'm going to talk about just two of them um, because I think they illustrate some interesting points. Um, so. St. Bernard Parish um, is one of my f favorite 
uh, cases, and, and I hadn't intended to talk about it, and then um, there was something that, that, that Carolyn mentioned to me, and then uh, George and I were chatting this morning, and I realized, well, yeah, I should talk about it a little bit. So let me first start off by just saying, in, in Louisiana, we don't have counties, we have parishes. Right, so uh, and that's you know this long thing about us and the French goes back a long time. It's a different story, right? But so when I say parish, you just think county. So uh, Saint Bernard Parish is a really interesting place. It's um, directly adjacent to the city of New Orleans, uh, south of the city of New Orleans, and and it is um, about 93% white. Right, it, um, it it is the place that a lot of white folks moved to when, um, when the city of New Orleans um, began to become mostly African American. Uh, so what happens is that, uh, that the, the Hurricane Katrina, which most people think of as, a, as an African American storm, um, is actually a storm that affected a lot of people um, who are African American, a lot of people are white, people of a lot of different ethnicities. But the camera crews never made it to St. Bernard Parish. If they had made it to St. Bernard Parish, they'd have this very different view of, of what Hurricane Katrina is because they would have had all this camera footage of white families on their rooftops. Because in St. Bernard Parish, every single home except for seven flooded. And I have never found those seven homes that didn't flood. Right? Um, so, St. Bernard Parish passed a law called the Blood Relative Ordinance. The Blood Relative Ordinance says that you cannot rent your single family home to someone that you are not related to by blood. Right? They passed this law immediately after Hurricane Katrina because they did not want African American residents from New Orleans to move into St. Bernard Parish after Hurricane Katrina. Right? So, um, the parish uh, president, or actually was a councilman at the time, was Craig Tafaro, and he really helped us in his case. He didn't mean to, um, he was speaking to the newspaper and he said, we are not changing the demographic. All we're doing is saying we want to maintain our demographic. I said, Craig, you are really great. That's helpful. <laughs> um, so um, one of the things about, that's really interesting about St. Bernard Parish is that if you ever wanted to join the Ku Klux Klan, it's the place that you'd go, <laughs> in Louisiana at least. And, um, and so there was a, a gentleman who was on the council who, um, you know, I would, is a, I'm kind of a housing policy nerd, I would watch the city council um, meetings and he would pretty consistently, you know, every six months or so, uh, make a mistake and say the N word, right? Um, so, um, so I always regarded this guy, and it was always this rumor that he was a member of the Klan. You know, they don't really publish the list of members, but yeah. So I just always assumed that he was this really terrible racist guy. So we put out a press release saying that, you know, this policy is bad and wrong, and that we think he should, uh, they should overturn it, and, um, and that if they don't, that we're going to sue them. And so he calls me. And so my, you know, uh, I didn't pick up the phone, I you know, just didn't recognize the number. I check my voice message and it's him. And my first question is, well, how the hell did he get my cell phone number? Right? Um, and then I check in with our lawyers to try to figure out, well, should I, you know, should I talk to this guy? You know, we're thinking about suing him. And they're trying to figure it out and everything. And so then he calls from a different number and I make a mistake and answer the phone. Well, God dog. Right? So, <laughs> so I answer the phone and he says, James Perry? I said, yeah, and he introduces himself and he says, look, I'm calling because I'm so happy that you all put out that press release. I said, well, you know we said we're going to sue you in the press release, right? He was like, yep, and you should sue us. Sue St. Bernard Parish. I said, what? He was like, yeah, because what they're doing is wrong and I'm against it. I said, what? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so he says, look, they're just doing this because they don't want black people to live in St. Bernard Parish. And they are just trying their best to keep all the black people out. So here's what you do. And he just goes on and tells me all the information that we need. And so the rest is history. We sue St. Bernard Parish. And we get them to overturn that ordinance. They do another ordinance. And we go, it, what ends up happening is that this litigation goes on for about 10 years. Um, because of Craig Tafaro's defiant stance to our litigation, um, he was councilman at that time. Um, the, 
people of the parish are like, wow, we're so grateful for what you're doing. Um, uh, we're going to promote you to parish president. Right? Uh, so, um, but we ultimately won after about 10 years of litigation and um, were able to overturn every ordinance and then also able to cause a lot of multifamily housing to be built in St. Bernard Parish. Right? Um, so, here, here, here's the interest, here I think are the interesting points about that case. You know, obviously it's funny, um, but you know, it, depending on how you tell the story. My, my colleague, uh, uh, John Roman, who spoke here last year, who um, you know, was the lawyer on the case, when he tells it, it's a much more stern version of the case. Uh, uh, but um, the, 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 the point is this, it is that the, this combination of, of litigation um, and, and pressure from litigation in, in some of these cases is absolutely fundamentally key. Right? And, and so in addition to the pressure of, uh, uh, of, of all these other crises, you also needed the pressure of the law in order to get things done. Right? Because some folks are so defiant um, and so insistent on using the crisis in order to move policy in the wrong direction, that you need all the pressure that you can to get things to go in the right direction. Right. The other case that I want to talk about is the Road Home case. Right. So the Road Home program was a program devised after Hurricane Katrina to help people rebuild their homes. Right. So, uh, this was an $11 billion program, $11 billion with a B, to help people rebuild their homes. And uh, the idea here was that homeowners would be able to get grants of up to $150,000 in order to rebuild their homes. So I want to pause here and make sure I differentiate between uh, a, a HUD housing program and a FEMA program. Right? Immediately after any disaster, FEMA comes in and helps you to uh, take care of any emergency issues. And usually that only lasts 90 uh, days, maybe six months. Uh, and sometimes in certain disasters, it'll go further than that. But when it comes to rebuilding in, in any permanent way, usually that's handed off to HUD. Right? And there's some question about what HUD would do. So in our case, HUD created this, um, well, HUD funneled. $11 billion into uh, the state of Louisiana, and the state decided to create the Road Home Program. Right? So here's the, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the case, but here's the fundamental uh, mistake that we made as an organization, that, and it's a mistake that, that this community has not made. And it is that we didn't pay very much attention to the Road Home Program until after it was already created. Right? So there was a huge flaw in the way the program was created. That as a fair housing expert and advocate, we would have caught it if any of us would have looked at it closely, but we didn't catch it. Right. And that fundamental flaw caused people in African American neighborhoods to get grants that were dramatically smaller than the grants that people got if they were in white neighborhoods, majority white neighborhoods. Right. Um, so when we began looking at the outcomes for our, for our clients, we found that if you were uh, in a majority uh, white neighborhood, your grant amount was, uh, on average, the full $150,000. If you were in a majority African American neighborhood, your grant amount was, on average, about eighty dollars to $90,000. Right. In fact, we were able to find two homes that were built by the same builder in the 1970s, both of them had uh, about 10 feet of water. Both of them uh, had the same floor plan. And so, in theory, the renovation should have cost about the same. And one homeowner in the African American neighborhood gets about $50,000. The homeowner in, in the majority white neighborhood gets the maximum $150,000. Right? Now, both homeowners needed about $200,000 to rebuild. So no one got enough. But of course, the, the payout is dramatically different. Now, the problem with the program was that they paid people based on the value of their home rather than the cost to rebuild the home. And you know, it's kind of Fair Housing 101, this idea that because of the way that neighborhoods are segregated, 
homes that are in um, majority white neighborhoods tend to be worth more than homes that are in minority neighborhoods. Something that if we had paid more attention to the creation of the program, we would have noticed. So now in the end, you know, so what happens ultimately is that we sue the road home program, um, which means that we end up initially suing the Bush administration, which later is the Obama administration. Uh, we sue a, a Democratic state governor, and then later that becomes a Republican state governor. Um, we sue them for $3 billion. Uh, we end up settling for just over half a billion dollars. Um, and, and so a, a lot of folks are able to rebuild, uh, especially in the lower ninth ward. Um, it's still far short of the amount of money that people needed to rebuild. Um, but it, it was a bit of a victory. The, the one challenge with litigation is, uh, is that, you know, it's kind of like a, a ball of confetti. Is that if there's a huge problem, you know, and, and you, you know, take this ball of confetti and you throw it all over, it's, and then you say, okay, how do you get all the confetti back? Like, it is really, really hard to get it all back into the ball. And, and so we were trying to figure out what does it take to do that. And a lot of times with human confetti balls, it's kind of impossible, right? There's no amount of money that gets it right. So if we had been more assiduous on the front end about policy, then we could have gotten it right. right? So there's an amazing policy that has been that I think has not passed yet, but that has been floating around the legislature here in California. It's uh, Bill 686, right? And it is the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Bill. And as far as I know, it is the most progressive state bill on integration in the nation. There's nothing like it anywhere else. It was proposed when I was here last year, but it still hasn't passed. What happens over and over again in times of crisis is that legislators will look around to see what bills they've been trying to pass that kind of fit in, that kind of address some of the issues, and then they will retool them to fit. Right? In the case of Louisiana, uh, after Hurricane Katrina, we had bills that were retooled to fit that privatized our school system because of Hurricane Katrina, privatized our public housing system because of Hurricane Katrina, resegregated our housing because of Hurricane Katrina, privatized the jails, Hurricane Katrina, removed key voting rights because Hurricane Katrina, set conservatives to win key uh, uh, voting districts based on redistricting, Hurricane Katrina said we had to do that. So the, the, one of the questions is how do advocates do some of the same? In Louisiana, we were constantly responding to the moment, which is appropriate. I'm certainly not suggesting that we shouldn't. But we should also think about the long-term opportunity. I dare say that our current president is probably not a fair housing guy. Um, and it, it, I tend to think he's not as focused on fair housing as the folks in this room. The rest of the nation is in a very difficult circumstance, of course, because uh, the federal government at this moment is seeking to undo the Obama push to affirm, uh, create a rule that would affirmatively further fair housing. Right? or at least implement that rule. The rule was created, and so it was time to implement that rule. And of course, the HUD secretary sought to remove that rule. 
uh, and make sure it wasn't implemented. So there really is only one jurisdiction in the nation that has sought to push against that tide. So I want to pause here um, and make sure we're all on the same page about what affirmatively furthering fair housing is. Um, so this is the bill, 686. All right. Do we have staff from public advocates in the room? Stand up. So you guys are pretty amazing, right? And um, I think we're going to hear from you guys some more this afternoon. But you guys made a website to make sure that people know about Bill 6, 686 and about what, what it's about, right? And so you, you guys can visit the website. You can learn more about the website. And then, of course, there's a Take Action button. Everyone should click on the Take Action button. Um, but it's a pretty wonky term, affirmatively furthering fair housing. Like every time I hear it, I, I'm just like, God, we need better marketing people in the civil rights movement. This is <laughs> terrible, right? So look, every other law in civil rights, frankly, s says that you have to refrain from discriminating, right? All of them say don't discriminate, don't discriminate, don't discriminate. And that's right, that's reasonable. But the government realized that there is at least one area where there's been so much damage done that we had to take some affirmative steps to undo the damage, right? And that's in the area of segregation, right? So this was a little history lesson that we talked about last year. And this is this idea that, that all American cities, literally every single city except for arguably one, Oak Park, Illinois, but every other city is segregated. Right? And you know, people will assume that cities are segregated because people choose to live in a segregated way, but it's not true. Cities are segregated because of decades of government policy. Cities didn't used to be segregated. They became segregated when the government instituted the GI Bill and when governments began making uh, interstates. Right? Uh, it's, it's not until um, the GI Bill, the interstate, um, FHA insurance, uh, all of these government policies that cities become uh, incredibly segregated. So if you look at all the money spent on uh, segregating cities, it comes up to trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that's been invested to segregate cities. So what the government said is, well, hey, let's spend some money integrating cities. We'll do that in part through our funding of community development block grants. But that hasn't worked yet, right? Um, in part because it's such a small amount of money, and then also because cities just haven't used it to integrate the, uh, the cities. So what the Obama administration said is, well, since we haven't made progress in all these years in integrating our cities, let's do something that finally gets it done. Let's do something that finally starts the process of getting cities integrated. And we'll do that by moving forward on the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, right? We'll say that as a city, you have to take affirmative steps to integrate. Make sense, right? It's a really complicated way to say, you just gotta try to make sure that black folks and white folks and Latinos and everybody else are comfortable living close to one another, right? So, um, it's a complex term, but it is a, an attempt to overcome this issue of segregation that is um, something that has been created by government policies for decades. So this idea that the Trump administration is now working to completely upend the goal of integration, of course, is quite troubling. But there is one community, one state, that has said, we still believe that integration is important. We still believe that it is important for fair housing to be the law of the land. And we're here right now in that community. 
right? This is it. It's not New York. It's nowhere else. It's not Louisiana. It's not Florida. It's California. <laughs> and I believe that in a weird way, you have all the right things in place to get it done. But the first step is that you have to get 686 passed. Right? And it's not going to be easy to do. All of you have to rally around the bill and get it done. Thank you for having me. I've been told to wait and take questions. I've been wondering about uh, what happened in Louisiana. You know, all the privatization. Are you taking any steps to try to unravel that? Well, it, it's so what, it's an all-consuming fight, and I, I think the answer is um, is yes. It is the um, Katrina became um, our lives, right? And um, and so those were Katrina fights, and now they just are life fights, right? Um, so you know, one of the and, and, and it's really interesting the way that, that a lot of those um, fights were initially New Orleans and Louisiana fights and then became national issues. So uh, one example is the privatization of, of schools. And this is, I think, one of the most controversial ones. Um, so when I say uh, privatization of schools, um, what I'm actually talking about is that our entire school system um, became a, a charter school system. Right? So, uh, so that we don't have any regular schools anymore. All of our schools are charter schools. So, you know, around the rest of the nation, charter schools are actually pretty popular. And Arne Duncan, who was Obama's um, education person, uh, championed charter schools and really pushed them as a fundamental uh, way to do things. And so uh, every day, local advocates are, are fighting to, to, to undo that. One of the big problems with charter schools is that you don't end up with a, a school board that you can go to when you're frustrated. And the board or the local group who runs the school doesn't have open meetings. Right? And so you don't have this kind of local government approach to, um, to manage your child's education. So it is a daily, daily, daily fight. The, the other interesting thing now is that, we're, that the, the, the kids who were swimming in Katrina waters are now coming of age. And, um, and so there are a lot of theories about the lead in the water and how it affected kids and, um, and, about, the, the, and, and about a lot of different issues that, that, that we're facing. So the, the short answer is, is yes. And you know, we could probably talk all day and all night about all the different ways in which it has overtaken our lives. Ah. Thank you. Good morning. Um, unless you've read the comment section beneath some of the articles in the IJ, um, you'd think that the N word was never said in Marin. And it's not really said often in the comment section, but there is a lot of dog whistle politics going on down there. And I don't think we have a chapter of the KKK in Marin. Aside from that, welcome to St. Bernard Parish. <laughs> and one of the, as you may know, after Westchester was pilloried, we were next because the disparities, which were very recently documented in Marin, are the highest of any county in California, particularly when it comes to housing. In fact, we are turning, or have turned in, to a plantation economy, where our workers, especially those with low incomes, commute in, and they are not part of our community. Since 2009, when HUD issued some negative findings on uh, Marin, and the fact that rather than having done an analysis of impediments every five years, they had not done one for 14 years. And they entered into a voluntary compliance agreement, which led to 
uh, the AI itself, which led to an implementation plan, which led to um, the initiative of a new AFH under the new rules of greater engagement in 2016. The very first update for the community at large won't be until June 11th, 2018. They had committed to holding at least two public hearings, which were not. They have nominated and held close to their chest two committees to represent the community, but have not reported out or allowed other people in. So they seem to be advancing Marin, my county seems to be advancing to the rear under the cover of the orange one. And I would like to find some area where HUD or some national organization would help pry open the local control that Marin so desperately clings to to preserve the status quo. Do you have any advice? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, applause is uh, appropriate. Um, so uh, a few thoughts. So, so uh, again, I'll, I'll, and I want to be careful. I don't want to disrespect uh, HUD staff because th there are a lot of really incredible and great HUD staff. Um, and, and we need great people at HUD. But it also sometimes can be really difficult to, um, to do some of the big things at HUD. Right? So uh, for a long time, um, folks have been pushing for, for HUD to, to do exactly what was happening, what happened in Westchester. Right? But the only thing um, that finally got HUD moving was that, uh, that folks found a private right of action. For, for the longest time, uh, it seemed like there was no private right of action around, around that issue. And it seemed like the only entity who could pursue that issue was a city itself or, or HUD, and HUD wouldn't pursue it. Right? So um, a, a really brilliant lawyer uh, who, who Caroline and I, I know and work with uh, came up with a, a way that didn't use the Federal Fair Housing Act um, to, to bring a private right, a right of action um, in that case. And that's the thing that, uh, and so then at that point, and then you know, with a, a really progress, progressive person um, in HUD looking at that, said, okay, well now we kind of have to move because if we don't, there are going to be all these suits all over the nation, right? So um, you, you, you do need um, something that kind of kicks folks in the butt to get them going, right? Um, I, 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 I also just note that this isn't the best time to rely on HUD as your, your partner in a um, progressive action. Right? Um, so, um, so, so I, th I think you, you're already at the, the right place, and I, I think you probably already know the, the perfect partner to work with. So the, the problem with, the, with the, the kind of private, private right of action that we're talking about, and I'm not going to get into all the details, is that is a very, very difficult case to bring. It is an extremely difficult case to bring, um, yeah, and, um, and, and you need everything to kind of fall into place in the exact perfect way. So. Um, it is, it is not a bad thing to continue to, to advocate from the outside until you're able to bring that private right of action, uh, just because that, it, it is a very, very tricky case. So, um, so I think point number one is, is yes, look into litigation and strongly um, consider it. Uh, point number two is, um, is the Fair Housing Advocates of Northern Cal uh, California are your perfect partner. Um, and, and then I, I think point, point number three is, um, is work with um, an entity like HUD, but in a skeptical fashion. Um, and, um, and I think there, there are a number of national partners who could be interested, um, and they would channel through your local fair housing organization. So, yeah. 
Hi, I'm Liza Crystal Demand. Can, can I can I just say one, I'm sorry one, yeah. one other thing, and and, that, and and I'll just say that the that when, when I came last year and I, when I started researching for my comments, I was absolutely shocked as I started reading all the housing stories, and I, 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 and, and um, the, the nimbyism just blew my mind. And you know, I'm someone who's done so much housing litigation. I've done housing cases all over. And so when I saw those stories, I was like, what, what, what? I, I just couldn't believe it, right? <laughs> so, um, and, and it's, it's, but it is part of my point here about the, the idea that this community is in housing crisis. Um, but, um, but as George says, um, apocalypse of the on an installment plan. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi. So I, I've been I've spent my entire career, last twenty years, litigating fair housing cases, um, bringing these cases. Woo. And I. My goodness. I, yeah. I know. I started when I was. You're still nine. standing. I started when I was and nine. And your your hair isn't yeah. completely white and gray, <laughs> right? I mean, I can't believe it. Um. So first, I want to say I appreciate every time you speak. I came last year as well, and I appreciate that you. You have a way of rekindling sort of the, the fire, the inspiration, why we do these cases. So thank you for that. Um, I have a question, though. Um, so I believe that the best tool that we have um, as advocates for fair housing is to bring litigation, to bring cases. Um, and that policy is obviously incredibly important, but I, I guess I'm having trouble understanding how, and I support it, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. I'm having trouble understanding how AFFH, how any affirmatively furthering fair housing um, bill or rule is going to be the solution that we think it is. Mm -hmm. um, especially when I look, as I look over the course of my career, especially over the last 10 years, the biggest problem we face in this state is affordability. Right? That is the crisis. And of course, it is inextricably linked with discrimination. Um, there's no doubt about that. But we have to have other tools, I think. Maybe it's in the policy arsenal, maybe it's in the litigation arsenal, to, to deal with this affordability crisis. Um, I'm not a, a landlord tenant attorney. I don't do, you know, I'm not a, I, I don't go on to the Hill or to, uh, to Sacramento to advocate for rent control. I support it, but I don't know enough about it. But I feel like there must be, I'm not sure, first of all, how a AFFH can, can help with that problem. And I feel like we need new theories. Like, what about, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a while, right? What we're seeing, I think, in California, especially in Silicon Valley and areas um, like LA, is reverse blockbusting, right? We're seeing developers target low-income communities, primarily populated by people of color, and they're targeting because they are in a prime real estate area close to Silicon Valley, but because they are, quote, undervalued because they are populated by people of color. So it's kind of a reverse blockbusting that's going in. They're going in and they are kicking out, and there are people in this room I, I know who've worked on these cases with me, but we're not getting a lot of traction in the courts. You know, there's a slippery slope of gentrification. Well, if, you know, if, 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 um, if it's illegal to be a gentrifier or if it violates the Fair Housing Act to target these communities, <laughs> well, then there goes the mission, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so I, just, I guess I wanted to have your, um, the benefit of your thoughts about how we deal with these emerging issues in affordability, displacement, gentrification within the context of fair housing? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. <laughs> oh, great, wonderful. Um, so the, uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. I, I think it is the, um, the great debate of the entire fair housing movement, frankly. And um, the, uh, so, so he, he, here is the, the issue, I think, around integration. Um, it, it, it is that we have never seen it, right? We've never had integrated communities. And so we just don't know if it works, right? We just don't know if integrated communities 
um, can actually do things like, for instance, relieve the, um, the difficulty of affordability. Right? So uh, think about this issue, for instance. Um, in some ways, there is a tax on whiteness. Right? If you happen to be a person who is white and you live in a neighborhood that is all white, your home costs more than a home that is in a majority African American or majority Latino neighborhood. Right? So you are cost burdened because you don't live with, uh, in, a, um, in a black neighborhood or a Latino neighborhood or an integrated neighborhood. Um, so in some ways, um, you end up paying a premium um, because of segregation. So one of the interesting questions is, does segregation play a key role in causing unaffordability, uh, not just in California, but all across the nation? And is California the most dramatic version of the way that, um, uh, the most dramatic version of the segregation tax. So I think the problem is because we don't really have any integrated communities, we just don't know. So um, I'll be really honest with you in that I go back and forth on this, on this issue about, um, you know, do we fight to make um, uh, segregated communities that are low income better? or do we fight to integrate those communities? And, and so, so far, the, the clear answer from the fair housing community has been both and. Um, and, and that has, as you've already noted, um, caused the fair housing advocates sometimes to be, to be pitted against one another, and then certainly affordable housing advocates and fair housing advocates to be pitted against one another. And unfortunately, um, there's not a clear answer. Uh, there's, a lot more um, that I could say about it with more time, but ultimately it all equals a lot of back and forth that, that, that doesn't provide a clear answer. Um, we've seen segregation and what it looks like, and, and we see that there are unaffordability crises, but we haven't seen what integration looks like and whether or not it can solve um, that crisis. My name is Walter Luttrell. I'm so sorry I'm to be the one to do this. This is the That's happened to me all my life. I, know. <laughs> I, I feel like I should say in this moment, I'll make it up to you somehow. I just don't know how. Um, but I, I'm so sorry. This is the part I hate the most because this is, you know, the, the conversation, the questions and the answers there where people really start to um, get into some of the meat of, 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 of the matter. So. I apologize ahead of time for shutting you down. Um, but this is not your last chance to ask James a question, just not in a public forum. Um, so I just want to say we're about to take a break, but please help me uh, th thank James one more time. OK. So. Dave Corey, wherever you are, you did mention that there was a um, fair housing update that's taking place, and I think you said June 11th, just to make sure. It's June 12th at 5.30 p.m. June 12th at 5.30 p.m., there's gonna be a fair housing update for those of you who are interested in coming, and I, and I urge you to come. 